Hello, everyone. This is Pam Moore, director of the New Mexico Judges and Lawyers Assistance Program. I'm also part of the New Mexico Wellbeing Committee, and I'm here to introduce Legal Wellbeing in Action, a podcast series offered by the New Mexico Wellbeing Committee. Last year was the first full year of the Wellbeing Committee at work. In identifying ways to bring well-being education and initiatives to the New Mexico legal community, we created a 2021 campaign called What a Healthy Lawyer Looks Like. 2021 is dedicated to educating the New Mexico legal community on a variety of well-being topics that pertain to work and home life. Our goal is that every judge, lawyer, law student, and legal staff person can find some aspect of their mental, emotional, physical, or spiritual health to improve upon. We strive to educate, encourage, and support the New Mexico legal community to show up as their best self in all aspects of life, which means we will be covering a wide variety of topics that relate to the whole human self. Thank you for being here today listening to Legal Wellbeing in Action. Hello everyone, Tanessa Aikens here for another episode of Legal Wellbeing in Action. I am the Clinical Coordinator for the New Mexico Judges and Lawyers Assistance Program and also the Podcast Series Coordinator. This month's episode will be featuring the topic of stigma and counseling. As part of the 2021 campaign, What a Healthy Lawyer Looks Like, we are featuring monthly wellness topics in our articles published to the State Bar of New Mexico's Bar Bulletin and airing each month's topic in our podcast episodes. I'd like to take the time to introduce our three speakers. Our host is Pamela Moore, who is the Program Director of the State Bar of New Mexico's Judges and Lawyers Assistance Program. She is also a licensed professional clinical counselor and a member of the New Mexico Wellbeing Committee. We're glad to have you back in another episode, Pam. Thank you so much for being here again. Our second speaker is Dr. Rex Swanda. Dr. Swanda is a clinical neuropsychologist who is board certified to the American Board of Professional Psychology. He has directed the neuropsychology services at New Mexico's Veterans Healthcare System from 1992 until retiring in 2017. He currently works as a private practice clinical neuropsychologist with a significant experience in assessment of decisional capacity, frequently serving the, as the court appointed qualified healthcare professional. He serves as an adjunct facility member at the Department of Psychiatry at UNM, and he currently teaches in the CNM series, Ethics and Fundamentals of Guardianship and Conservatorship. And last but not least, our third speaker, Dr. Evelyn Sandine. Dr. Sandine is a licensed psychologist who is board certified in clinical psychology. She has lived and worked in Albuquerque for 25 years, and she has a private practice in which she specializes in psychotherapy with professional clients, training, and consultation. Thank you, Pam, Dr. Swanda, and Dr. Sandine for joining us on this topic today. I'm pretty excited to have all three of you in the room talking about it, so thank you so much for being here. And as always, thank you to our listeners for tuning into Legal Wellbeing in Action. We hope you enjoy. Thank you, Tanessa, for that introduction. Well, hello, listeners. My name is Pam Moore, and I'm the director of the New Mexico Judges and Lawyers Assistance Program. With me today is Dr. Evelyn Sandine and Dr. Rex Swanda. Thank you both for being here today and being our guests on Legal Wellbeing in Action podcast series. It is an honor to be talking with both of you today, so thank you. You're welcome. We big, yeah, thanks. Uh, we have a big topic to tackle today, um, one that is very near and dear to my heart and is also one that every state lawyer assistance program or lab um, struggles with in trying to help legal professionals, and that is the topic of stigma. So, um, and overall, it's really the stigma of reaching out and asking for help. I think there are a lot of, well, I don't think, I know, there are a lot of lawyers out there, not only in New Mexico, but other states that really do need, need the help. And they have a big um, fear, let's just call it a fear for right now, of reaching out and asking for it. So today we're gonna kind of unpack that. And there are several areas in unpacking this topic that I'd like to cover today. 
One is I'd like to briefly touch on what it means to feel like to feel like you're struggling. So we throw around the word struggle a lot today. And I really kind of want to break that down and say, how would I know I'm struggling? And how would I know if a colleague is struggling? So that's really number one, but I don't want to spend a lot of time there. Um, the second thing is, is what to look for in a mental health professional when somebody does seek help. I think that is, I, I really want to go into that. How does this process work? Let's, let's just demystify it. And what are the benefits in partnering with a professional that has that kind of skill set and experience? So that's kind of the second area I want to cover. And then number three, what are the co components that would make up a healthy law firm or a legal organization? So um, if I were to move to uh, any legal or organization or, or you know, state organization or a law firm, how would I know that they are concerned about my well-being? And then I'm signing up to partner to be an employee with a, a healthy um, organization. Uh, so that's number three. Number four is where can legal professionals reach out for help if they're struggling? And we have a whole list of uh, resources and services that we're going to talk about. And lastly, I'm sure after we get done with this, the listeners are going to want to know where they can find you two and how they could get in touch with you two if they want to... Um, uh, reach out for your services. So the first one is, is let's talk a little bit about struggle and, and struggle in yourself, um, struggle in somebody else. Um, one of the things that I hear a lot is I didn't even know I was burnt out until like I had been burnt out for a while. So I'm going to toss it to one of you, whoever wants to unpack that first. It's fine with me. Sure. This is Evelyn Sandine. Um, yeah, I think this is a good place to start, Pam, because there is documented evidence that lawyers are at higher risk of mental health and substance abuse difficulties than other, even other professionals that work in high stress positions. So it is very, very common among, uh, in the legal community. And I think, yeah, so burnout sort of has three components. And this is, these are things that uh, you can see in yourself, perhaps, but even more importantly, you'll get feedback, perhaps, from friends or colleagues about it. Uh, one part of burnout is sort of energy depletion, just feeling very, very tired, uh, not having energy to do new initiatives, not wanting to participate, uh, and, and that exhausted feeling. Uh, another part of burnout is reduced efficiency. And this might be something that your colleagues will notice. You know, what is up with, with this person who's usually so efficient? Um, and then the third part is a little bit more subtle, but um, I think, again, colleagues and friends and family will notice this. The tendency to distance from your job through cynicism, negativity, uh, sometimes comes out as irritability. So if a person who has previously been well engaged, uh, interested in the mission that they're working toward and now are experiencing sort of distancing, cynicism, negativity, uh, those are all symptoms of burnout. Right. So if, if, um, if, if people are kind of reacting to us like, oh, um, what's up with her, what's up with him, why, you know, or we're seeing that in somebody else, so just, I mean, what I'm getting from you is not like they were or not like I've known them before, whether it's, you know, um, not, not as en energetic, not as efficient, maybe um, not showing up to court, that would be a big one, but just not as, as on it, right? Not as focused, not as clear as they used to be. Um, and then also they seem to be more irritable or maybe there's more outbursts or they're just not as friendly and, and not be it as they used to be. So those are kind of all things that I'm hearing from you. If a person were to, to notice this in themselves or notice this in somebody else, or people are telling you this, you might wanna take a look at, at, at what's going on with you and, and, and uh, you know, how you've been feeling lately. Absolutely. Yeah. I really like what you said about a change. So noticing a change. Um, that's a big piece of noticing that something's going on with you. There's, there's some other things besides burnout I wanted to mention that people yes. should 
should be noticing in themselves. A big one is substance use issues. Mm -hmm. So um, it is pretty normal to, uh, in a high stress position, to want to relax with a cocktail. That is not an unnatural urge for many mm -hmm. people and nothing wrong with that. Uh, however, if you or if people around you are noticing an increase in mm -hmm. that and, you know, certain, certain legal um, uh, cultures do, are hard drinking cultures and we can get right. used to a level of, of alcohol consumption that is actually not healthy. I thought I'd just mention what uh, the National Institute on uh, Substance Abuse says in terms of uh, heavy drinking. They define heavy drinking for men as more than four drinks in one day or more than 14 in a week. And for women, more than three drinks in one day or more than seven in a week. So um, just to know that standard and, Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and sort of uh, keep an eye on that. And again, change. If you're noticing that there is a change in your pattern or somebody else's pattern, um, that could be a, a sign that the coping strategy is now becoming an issue in itself. Right, thank you. Dr. Swanda, yes. Yes, I, I think um, the piece that I would add to that um, is that um, we all are very good, though, especially bright people who are used to feeling capable and in charge, mm -hmm. certainly in charge of themselves, in control, and really for whom in control is important. It's easy yeah. to also gloss over and not really recognize those changes in oneself. I sure agree with um, Dr. Sandine in thinking about change in any direction. And, um, but there's also that very human tendency to normalize or to rationalize and say to ourselves, well, this is a really busy period and I, I just have to kind of soldier through this and um, make, it, uh, make it work. If I can get through the holidays, then I'll take a break. But somehow that break Absolutely. never comes. So Absolutely. looking for feedback. Yeah, yeah. Ask for feedback, I would add. Okay. Absolutely. I'm so glad you mentioned that. One of the things that I hear a lot is um, when it comes to lawyers, especially is I'm the one that solves problems, so I can't have a problem. And, and, and lawyers or the legal community tends to be of that profession that does want to be in control. And it, and it makes sense given what they do of all the different components of a case that they have to be in control of and how they analyze the data. And, you know, it's a, it is an honorable and a hard job at the same time. And so um, I really want to acknowledge what you said is that, is that there, there's always, uh, there's this tendency I see that I can figure this out on my own. I can control this on my own. I, how, you know, I'm a brilliant lawyer. How come I can't figure out how to stop drinking, right? It, it, it's baffling. It really is. But I hear that a lot. So thank you for bringing that up. So that's a really good segue into then once I do figure out or I do notice or I do acknowledge that um, I I'm, might I'm, I'm be struggling, I might not be doing as well as I thought I was or would like to be, what do I do now? Sure. Did, did we want to talk about barriers that people might encounter? Do you want to go on and talk? Sure. Yeah, because I think, sure. you know, the very next thing that tends to come up is what do I do now? And I don't know what to do or I don't want to do that. So right. like um, Dr. Swanda was saying, I think a big barrier for uh, lawyers especially is going to be identity. And Pam, you were mentioning that as well. Mm -hmm. I'm the person who problem solves. Mm -hmm. I'm the person who is bulletproof, who is always confident. Uh, those are sort of stereotypes of of lawyers, but they're often um, taken in as identity as well. And that does not leave a lot of room for asking for help. And so I, I think, you know, your listeners are very intelligent, educated people. I would just ask for a moment of self-reflection around that. And, uh, you know, that that doesn't really make sense, that we're all experts in some ways, and yet also we all can use help and uh, require help. I like to um, talk about seeking mental health treatment in terms of uh, adopting a dental health model, the way we go to a dentist. Mm. Um, we don't have to have an 
you know, all be losing all our teeth in order to go to a dentist. Hopefully we do it in a preventive way. Right. And uh, hopefully we do it along the lifetime at different points uh, as we need it. So I hope we all think of dental health as a perfectly natural thing to seek help with. And I think it is uh, definitely the case that mental health as well, it's just an aspect of being human that we dip in and out of being healthier or not so healthy. Right, absolutely. I love that you mentioned that analogy or that dental health model. Yeah, Dr. Swanda, fabulous. Well, I, I wanted to ask my, uh, my colleague, Evelyn, who really works in psychotherapy in a much more expert way than I do, um, how, um, uh, if part of that model could be uh, like seeking support from friends in an informal way versus professional support, how she might see that. Yeah, Different. thanks, thanks, Rex. I think uh, that's a great point. That there is a lot of there are a lot of ways to seek help, um, in addition to or before one seeks professional help. And um, this is another intersection, maybe, of legal culture with mental health and mental well-being. Um, but if possible, it's we know there's documented research on this that if you have a confiding friend a person with whom you can share struggles, not just complain. Complaining is part of being a friend sometimes, but, but beyond that, um, also being somewhat transparent about how you're feeling, what's going on, what's affected you uh, in your legal work, you know, how things are going, perhaps a case is disturbing in a certain uh, way, which would be very natural. So somebody at work to share that with. Yeah, thanks, Rex. That's a, that's a, right really number one in a way. Absolutely. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I so um, believe in that. I mean, I, I think having an honest, non-judgmental um, person, that friend, you know, that you can talk to that you know is not going to maybe always tell you what you want to hear, but what you need to hear, right? But at the end of the day, no matter what you tell them, they are there to support you and they have positive regard for you. And, and they're, you know, th it's that person where you can, you could talk about things and connect with. And you're right. There are so many studies out there that show that connection and relationships are one of those vital things that we need in life, just like food and water, that if we do not have connections and relationships, we will not thrive. And it doesn't always have to be um, in fact, you know, very rarely does it have to be with a mental health professional. Um, that can be in addition to also nurturing and growing those connections and those relationships that help bolster us up through our life. So, Dr. Swanda, did you want to say something that I... <laughs> no, no, I, I appreciate, um, I think, letting that point blossom a bit. Thanks. Yeah, oh my gosh. So, so, so important and so vital. So let's talk a little bit about then um, the benefits of really talking to a mental health professional. So let's say that I do think I need to do that. So what, what are the benefits? Because I'm not really sure people understand um, what they can gain out of it. And, and, and I hear this a lot from people that ha do have seen a mental health professional, a therapist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and they say, oh my gosh, it changed my life. Um, I think everybody should talk to a counselor or a therapist. I mean, this is what I hear from people that, that go and they don't go every single week for the rest of their lives, right? So they can they can go for a little while until they get over the hump and then maybe it's a maintenance mode after that. But but there's a very big majority of people out there that are that still have this distance or this fear or this it's an unknown. So like what am I going to get out of it? So which who would like to speak to that? <laughs> I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think there's a couple of streams that come to mind. One is that you are hiring somebody for their knowledge, expertise, and training, and uh, lawyers should be very familiar with that model. Um, so, you know, you do want somebody, I think, and expect somebody who's going to bring something to the table. They have ideas. They have uh, work with you on a treatment plan. They know where you're going and what, what to do. And the benefit is just being in that 
confiding, non-judgmental relationship. And hearing yourself talk can be very, very therapeutic. You can really understand a lot better uh, where you are, what's going on for you, and get some insight into what you need to do. I think that in combination with getting some um, informed direction from the therapist. And some of these things can be relatively simple. They could be things that you've already even heard about, but there's a beauty in going back to the same person who's checking in and saying, how did you do with that? How did the meditation go? How did that talk with your wife go? Um, that follow through in a non-judgmental space is extremely helpful in getting traction on, on making changes. Right. I told, yeah, I, I love that. And an unbiased. I mean, this is somebody that's not part of your family circle. They're not in your friend circle. So they're completely outside of the circle. And I think they can lend a different perspective right, than anybody else. And so I find it always helpful to have that, that person that is not part of my life um, when I'm telling them something, give me a perspective on, on what they think is going on. So that's always helpful. Dr. Swanda, yes. Sure. Uh, just to add, um, I'd like to add from the perspective of someone who uh, frequently works with attorneys um, in a uh, consultation basis. And so occasionally I've had attorneys contact me back channel in a more informal way, asking for a referral for who would be, you know, I've got some things going on. I'd kind of like to see uh, maybe a, a therapist or a psychologist. Can you recommend anyone? And so uh, I was trying to think in an orderly way, my thought process for who to refer them to because there are so many people out there, uh, people with different training. So I think, first of all, what's the nature of the problem? And I know that Dr. Sandin will be able to expound on any of these points, but, but just thinking about the referral, I think first, what is the nature of the problem? Is this a personal kind of life development? Where am I in my career kind of issue? Or is this um, a substance use issue? Uh, and they may not tell me this, but I try, I go through that thought process in thinking about who to refer them to. I also think about, depending on what the nature of the problem is, who are the therapists I know out there who would be well suited to bring expertise to that niche area? Uh, because we have, I, I have colleagues who are really well versed and just, um, just great for dealing with some of the toughest issues around chronic substance use or uh, trauma, uh, deep trauma, uh, though that's a difficult issue. Uh, you, you know, we could go into all kinds of detail. And um, so um, I also think about the person I'm talking to, what are some of their, the characteristics that I get from them? Uh, is this, how insightful is the person? Now, usually dealing with professionals, these are folks who are capable of good insight, but not always, you know, let's, you know, we're all on a continuum. And so I kind of think about uh, insight and also, um, uh, is this someone who would be a good candidate for thinking about um, some of the kind of mindfulness techniques? Again, I, I know Dr. Sandin could talk in detail about specific techniques, but um, so thinking about the match between the professional and attorney in this case, and uh, who a potential therapist might be and what kind of training would they need. So I just right. want to throw that in there. Great, great. And, and once, uh, this is kind of my rule of thumb, I'd like to hear what you two think about this, but when I do send somebody to a therapist, I ask them to give it two or three sessions to know if it's a good fit. I said, it's, it's sometimes, you know, in the first session, but Sometimes I think it's really hard to know in the first session, but I think by the third session, you would know if it's a good fit. And if it's not a good fit, if you're just not feeling it, it doesn't mean that that's not a good therapist. It just means it's not a good fit with the personalities or the characteristics of the two of you. And I, and I tell them that's okay, that's totally okay, right? Come back, we'll find somebody else. It just means it's not a good fit. And so um, I think that helps alleviate. I've heard people stay with therapists that it wasn't a good fit, be, you know, for a very long time. They're like, 
I didn't know I could go find another therapist. And I said, absolutely, right? Don't oh, say that. I, I really <laughs> support that. I really support that, Pam. Um, yeah, and some people do offer even free consultations, so you'll get at least a taste of that. Right. But it is not a, a unusual thing at all that somebody has one or two sessions with a therapist and doesn't come back. That is a really common thing and no hard feelings, that's fine. Um, it's a completely natural thing to do. I think, um, you know, you'll know, the person seeking help will know, I agree with you, three sessions would be the absolute ma max, probably I would even go a little shorter, one or two because you want to know if this person is somebody who is going to give you what you feel you're you need in this situation um lawyers tending to be very problem solving uh outcome oriented people um i think would want to know you know what's the goal here and sort of come to a, a basic treatment plan with their therapist and that should be done you know pretty early so that kind of thing to see if you're going to get the kind of guidance and support that you're looking for yeah, I agree right. with you. Right. Yeah, I, I'm going to add one more thing since you said that, and that is um, I, I do tell people kind of, you know, also when I refer them or, or I tell them to go get a sponsor, that is not your best friend. They are not there to tell you what you want to hear. They're not there to, to yeah, um, uh, sympathize with you, let's just say. They are there to tell you what you need to hear. They should be there to challenge you. They are also offering, you know, validating, and they are also having a ton of empathy and compassion. But if they're challenging you and you're a little uncomfortable, that is still okay. That does not mean it's a bad fit. Th that, is, that is their job is to challenge you. And it may be that you're just struggling with a new train of thought or change or growth or development in some area that, that maybe you need to branch out in or think about things a little differently. So it can be uncomfortable. Um, but there's a difference between uncomfortable, not a good fit, and uncomfortable, this person's really challenging me, my thought process, and maybe my perspective, and how I've done things, and my belief systems, and my patterns. Maybe I need to take a look at all that. The Solutions Group, the State Bar of New Mexico's EAP provider, offers confidential and free professional counselors to support employees and their direct family members by offering short-term counseling assessment, and referrals for any life struggle. This includes drug addiction, relationship conflict, anxiety, depression, and grief and loss. Other services include dependent care, crisis assessment, intervention, and educational presentations, free well-being webinars, and an online stress assessment tool. Call 505-254-3555 or one 866 Two five four three five five five, and then identify with NMJ Lab to schedule an appointment or video visit. Yeah, exactly. I think that's an excellent point. Um, you know, there's a phrase out there: if nothing changes, nothing changes. So, yeah, Absolutely. therapy is a place to make changes. So, and human beings, we're just funny. We want change, but we don't want to do anything different many times. So. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that's, a, that's pretty normal. But I, I like that, you know, to look at whether is this person challenging me in a, yeah. in a way that could potentially be helpful or am I just not right. feeling a fit? Yeah. On, a hope, on a hopeful note, change often starts with a very tiny first step as well. Yes, absolutely. Tons of quotes out there on change. So I love that. Okay, so I, I, I know we talked a little bit about resources and services, and I do want to get to that more towards the end. But right now, let's go into that third area, which are what are the components or what should I be looking for if I'm going to find a job at a law firm or a you know, legal organization? What When it comes to the... Um, the tone, the environment, the 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 feeling, if you will, of of this play, this uh, workplace environment. How do I know that it's a healthy place for me to be? That may, that they care about my well being. Um, you know, I know there are, are are a lot of legal organizations out there, especially law firms, that are still all about the billable hour and and money, and that's it. Um, but I also am hearing more. Um, 
law firms and, and, and really more of the young lawyers saying, I want to work in a healthy place. I want to work in a place that is concerned and cares about my well-being. So let's give me your, uh, you know, your perspective on that, what to look for, what would it look for if I, if I am a law firm and I'm trying to, to be a little healthier and I'm trying to, to have more well-being options available for my employees, what does that look like? Yeah, go ahead, Rex. Well, I, um, I think that the overall most important issue would be clear communication, having, and, and, which implies clear expectations uh, as a starting point. And uh, I think if you have good communication uh, up and down, not just uh, bottom, not just top down, um, this is what we want from you, but someone who's listening to hear what folks uh, who may be uh, administratively below what they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that goes uh, with what we know about burnout, that um, burnout is associated with having unclear job expectations and lack of support, uh, a perceived lack of support. So, um, you know, when lawyers are sort of forced to work in isolation without much support or much feedback, that can be very um, distressing in terms of mental health and burnout. So yeah, I think you'd want that good communication. There's also lots of studies showing that um, when bullying of any kind is allowed in the workplace, that there are not, um, you know, not, this is not rocket science, but it's been proven that there are bad mental health, health outcomes to that. Right. that um, bullying is extremely toxic. Uh, people really respond very poorly to it. So. Um, that would be another thing to look for, maybe ask associates about is, is there any, any bullying going on in this work environment? Right, right. We do um, several, we've had a podcast and we've uh, done a whole uh, article and podcast on incivility. And I, I kind of, uh, when I think of bullying, I also think of incivility. And um, I, I did do some research on that. And it's exactly what you said is that when there is incivility in the environment, um, even if you are not the one that's doing it or the one that's receiving it, if you're just around it and you're, and you're hearing it, it absolutely affects you. And there's been numerous studies where the productivity of those just in the office space where it's happening, that tension, that negative energy absolutely affects their productivity in a negative way. So they're not as productive. They're not as happy. There's more sick days. People don't come to work as often whenever there's incivility or bullying in the office. So great. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Yes, Dr. Swanda. You know, just, um, I don't know if anything like this exists uh, in the bar, and it may already be there, but I'm thinking here in Albuquerque, we have a great model with the annual Healthy Workplace Awards that are given out, um, those have been partially uh, supported through the American Psychological Association. And over the years, uh, the, the annual Healthy Workplace Awards were administered and overseen by Samaritan Counseling. That group is no longer in place and CNM now organizes that. But I'm thinking that the whole point of that was to organize and get word out and provide models of what would be a healthy workplace environment. And uh, so the focus there was not to focus on what's wrong with the workplace, but what's right. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking it may be a neat project within the bar uh, or uh, some similar entity would be to produce uh, an, a model that would work, you know, and, and just start that process because it would naturally evolve over the years. Right, I totally agree with that. And I, I uh, think that our, our parent organization, the Commission on Lawyer Assistance Programs has, has something like that. And um, uh, so, yeah, so getting that out there would be a, a good thing uh, for us to do. Yeah, I like that a right. lot. You know, another thing that comes to mind in terms of a healthy law firm would be one in which uh, the leaders acknowledge the stress or acknowledge the distress. You know, if there's a particularly upsetting case uh, for example, that uh, the firm is working on, uh, that there is such a thing as secondary traumatization, meaning being confronted with evidence, um, you know, of human suffering 
in various mm -hmm. forms is distressing for human beings. So just having that acknowledged uh, by legal supervisors, by uh, partners, you know, by higher ups within the hierarchy is, is very helpful. It normalizes that we have, we are human, we have reactions. And then, you know, even better would be to normalize seeking help, you know, maybe in, in staff meetings or whatever to, to give referrals to, you know, talk about that to some extent, which would be a big step against stigma, you know, saying right. it's normal. Uh, we all do this at some point. Um, so yeah, that those would be really the uh, icing on the cake. If those right, I love them. that. I love that. When you, when you talk about that, I also think of how that parallels personal relationships and how personal relationships, um, when there's a validation of each other's feelings, even though um, I may not understand or I may not be feeling that myself, I can absolutely validate that that is how you're feeling in this situation with this experience and just the validation, just speaking it and, and, and acknowledging it and somebody really that validating how you're feeling is huge. I mean, when I think of that, I think of a balloon deflating, just like, you know, I feel so much better just to have somebody validate how I feel and just let's, you know, talk about it. So thank you for mentioning that. I love that. Okay. Um, Let's talk a little bit about resources, and then I'm going to give you know, each one of you uh, last words on this topic. <laughs> um, but let's talk about uh, resources. And um, let me let me start start with JLAP um, and and our EAP. So the Judges and Lawyers Assistance Program is um, a program out of the State Bar of New Mexico. Um, we are a free service resource to any legal professional. So whether you're a judge, lawyer, law student, um, or a paralegal, law clerk, or an immediate family member, we are available to you. Um, we have many components to our program. Um, you call us, everything that you say is confidential, whether you're calling in about yourself or somebody else, it's all free, it's all confidential. Um, most of what Tanessa and I do is triage. So we listen, we assess, and then we get you to the resource or the service that best fits what's going on for you. Okay, so that's in a nutshell what we do. Um, the other thing that JLAP does is we contract, we partner with a, an employee assistance program um, through the Solutions Group, which is, which is based here in New Mexico. Um, they, you, they will offer you free four free counseling sessions per person per issue per year. So what does that mean? That means that if you are dealing with uh, grief and loss, you can call them and you can get four free counseling sessions. They are not going to diagnose you. You do not give them your insurance. It is absolutely free. The only thing you need to do is identify with NMJ Lab. You can call again that very same year if you're having um, conflict in a relationship or you're struggling with anxiety or something else has come up. You get another four free sessions and that goes for anybody in your immediate family, um, law firm, like I said, any legal professional. So I want to make that clear that that is free um, to all legal professionals. All right, so those are my two plugs for what's offered through the State Bar of New Mexico, and I'm going to hand it over to you two because I know there are a lot more resources out there that um, that, that you two want to mention. Yeah, I just want to say what a great resource you're offering, and I hope people take advantage of that. That is awesome. And also, it's confidential. Absolutely. Both of them are completely, completely confidential. Yes. Yeah, I know that confidentiality can be a That's concern. A big deal. Yes. And, um, you know, just want to shout out there that, you know, your organizations, but also any licensed therapist is bound by a code of ethics to extreme confidentiality and uh, privacy rules. So um, that should not be a concern. So in terms of other uh, sources, one of the best ones is word of mouth. Um, that would be the one I uh, mm -hmm. would trust the most if you know anyone who has had a successful experience in therapy. Uh, to, to get with that therapist, or even if that therapist is full, to, at, to see if you can ask that person for another referral. I think that's a really, really helpful way to do it. And we do have the uh, Psychology Today website, 
and those are um, you can those are classified by area that you live in. And a lot of people also are now doing telehealth. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention that that might be more convenient for for some uh, folks who are you know you save time on commuting to and from a, a session and can fit it in in different points in your day. And a lot of people are doing uh, that kind of service now. So um, so that's the Psychology Today website. Uh, you can look that up and you can sort that by the type of therapist, uh, problem areas that they specialize in, uh, insurance that they take and stuff like that. So that would be a recommendation. Um, there's also your insurance carrier uh, will have a list of um, people, pro uh, providers, mental health mm -hmm. providers that are covered under their policy. I wanted I think, to just, I just wanted to, yeah. Oh. Well, and on that note, um, I do run across um, in my practice, since I'm not seeing folks for therapy, but usually for one-time neuropsychological consultations, I wanted to echo what um, uh, Pamela had said earlier about looking for a good fit, particularly when we go through our insurance companies, um, there, that can sometimes feel kind of limiting. And, but I wanted to encourage folks out there, uh, especially professionals, to, to think about who they're, you know, meet a person if they have a limited selection to consider that there can still be a wide range of resources out there, uh, including some private pay options that might be a good fit as well. Um, sometimes it may not be as expensive as you think, and it's worth contacting a therapist if you think they're a good match for the needs that you have, or you have good recommendations for that person. Right, right. Great. Okay. Um, so, so, I, oh, go ahead, Dr. Swanda. Um, you can tell me if this is a good time. I just wanted to put in a, a mention of the succession planning um, experiences that I've been involved in, which we're talking today in this session about uh, the side of folks who are probably going to have insight and be aware of the issues they're confronting. I just wanted to mention that there are some resources I think that are available through the bar uh, that have been offered as uh, part of succession planning CLEs, uh, mm -hmm. really referring to folks who are um, more on the impaired side due to issues around maybe Alzheimer's or other types of dementia or uh, alcohol issues, which make it difficult for the person themselves to seek help. So I just wanted to mention that that may be um, something for folks to investigate through the Bar Association. Uh, right. there, there are those materials as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, we do have a succession planning handbook and a succession planning committee um, that, that would walk somebody through um, winding down their practice if they needed to do that for whatever reason. So yes, and, and they can call the state bar and they can get uh, one of those handbooks for free. Right, and, and I'm also speaking, I think, to the situation if, um, if a listener were um, concerned, maybe not just for themselves, but thinking also mm -hmm. about a colleague um, whose behavior had changed and they were trying to figure out what to do about uh, those changes. Um, especially if they'd had preliminary conversations and the person wasn't amenable or de totally in denial. Just right. so, tough situations sometimes. Yes. <laughs> Dr. <Another Sandy>. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did just want to mention um, suicidal thoughts uh, because mm -hmm. having suicidal thoughts is actually a sort of normative experience. Most of us will have suicidal thought at some time in our life. However, uh, obviously, there's danger there if, if those thoughts are persistent, if they're accompanied by wanting to die, if they're accompanied by a plan to die. All of those things indicate um, danger to the person. And so I did want to put out there the suicide hotline number, 1-800-273-8255, or going to an emergency room, um, especially in, in Albuquerque, Caseman, or UNM. Um, those resources are always there and um, obviously very important uh, to do that if you need to do that. Um, the other thing in terms of safety that I just wanted to mention since we had been talking about uh, alcohol overuse is that if you are uh, in a state where you know that you are dependent on alcohol, that is that you need a drink uh, 
the next day or you're going to have shakes and other symptoms. If you're in that position, please do not detox on your own. Alcohol detox can be life life-threatening and um, you know, get help from a physician or from uh, UNM has a, a program ASAP. Um, there, are, there are options there, but you need some medical help usually to detox from alcohol successfully. So right. I just wanted to mention those two things. Totally agree. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, we, we uh, field those calls uh, quite often where somebody's in that state and I say the same thing. Please do not stop cold turkey. That is not, we're not doing that. So, and then we try and get them to a place where they can detox um, safely with medical help. So, okay. So um, I want to, um, last thing to mention is that uh, Dr. Sandine wrote an amazing article and it will be coming out in the bar bulletin in September. Um, in there, there is a list of resources um, at the end of her article, um, the ones that we talked about and more um, with all the contact information. Listeners can also go to the State Bar of New Mexico, their, that website, and there is a button in the middle of that page that is a big button that says well-being and they can click on that and they have access to well-being resources all of our bar bulletin articles, our podcasts, any information about JLAP, uh, more information about the Wellbeing Committee and the EAP. So there's a lot of information there. Also, uh, COLAP, the Commission on Lawyer Assistance Programs, um, that is out of the American Bar Association. They have their own website and they've got a list of resources and articles and podcasts that they are doing as well. So um, locally in New Mexico, we have a lot of information. Nationally, we have a lot of information um, and, and the contact information is there for, for all of it. Um, on the website. Okay, so thank you both very much for being here. Any last words? I'm gonna give you both a, any last words on this topic. Any, um, you know, where can listeners, where can they go if they want to find both of you, if they would like to reach out to both of you? Um, sure, well, probably the best place for me is my website, uh, www.evelynsandine, all one word, dot com and that has contact information. I do have a private practice myself and uh, do consultation. Um, I, I just am so happy that you're doing this. Um, my son is in law school and I am very invested in lawyers uh, doing well and doing good. So uh, thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here and, and good luck to your son. And <laughs> yeah, you absolutely have a personal connection to this profession, so thank you. Dr. Well, it's always, um, I, I always feel real honored to um, have opportunities to work with uh, uh, the uh, legal side of our community. So um, my, uh, my contact really um, is just my last name, Swanda, followed by rm at gmail.com. And, um, you know, um, I primarily work with uh, uh, issues around uh, decisional capacity and frequently serve as a QHCP. So if folks want to reach me, uh, a lot of the uh, folks who, you know, the elder law and uh, state planning attorneys know me too. So I'll be real glad to help anyone uh, get connected up if anyone Great. wants to reach out. Thank you. Thank you both so much for being here today. It was an honor to talk to both of you. Thank you for your, your time, your experience, your expertise in this area, and thank you for sharing it with our legal community. And um, uh, maybe we will have you back again. <laughs> so thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening. This episode was produced by the State Bar of New Mexico's Wellbeing Committee and the New Mexico Judges and Lawyers Assistance Program. All editing and sound mixing was done by Blue Sky eLearn. Intro music is by Gil Flores. The views of the presenters are that of their own and are not endorsed by the State Bar of New Mexico. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment or legal advice. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition.